Hi, Jeff Bridgman here in York County, Pennsylvania of Jeff R. Bridgman, American Antiques. I've come here today to tell you a story about a wonderful 34 star Civil War period flag. Now, the stars of this flag, which is really small in scale, and it's behind me. I'll show it to you better in a minute. Uh, they're arranged in something called a double wreath or a double medallion pattern. This consists of two rings of stars with a star in the center and a star in each corner flanking the main design, very much like the flag that I've used on my business card for, oh, more than 15 years anyways. This is a 33 star flag, so very close in, in date to the flag behind me. But that was on the obverse of the flag. The obverse is what you might call the front today because in the 19th century, there really was no front or back. So whether you're running into battle this way or running that way or a ship was going this way or going that way, I mean, the flag could appear however, right? The flag was a utilitarian object in the 19th century, especially in the first half. And we're just after that when we hit the Civil War, um, because the flag really was used on ships to, to mark American ships, to mark um, military troops, uh, especially during battle. It was important as a signal, right? It was important to identify ships on the open seas. It was important to identify forts. And it was used for political campaigning some. It was used by private citizens a little, but that didn't really take off until the Civil War. So when you see a flag that's homemade, let's say, sometimes that can have, it can be just one-sided. And it's just as likely to have the stars on what you might call the reverse today as it would be, um, on the obverse. There's a, really a 50% chance it can go either way on a one-sided flag. So this is a homemade flag for sure, but it's a two-sided flag. This is a homemade flag for sure, but it is different on one side than the other. Very different. On the front, five-pointed stars. On the reverse, eight-pointed stars, and in a different configuration which is really remarkable. That trait exists on just really three other flags that I know of. Now, there's a fourth sort of that has 13 on one side that also appear on the other side, but then 21 more stars to bring the count to 34. Remarkable flag. Um, and you really could say that's sort of a fifth, but it is almost never encountered. And to have stars that have a different number of points on them, also a rare and really extraordinary feature. And these are arranged in what's known as, oh geez, you make it up. This is what I call a propeller medallion or a four pointed great star. It's so rare that there are only three others. Remarkably, I've owned all four of them. I sold two and I presently own two. Now, the, these are all different because they're homemade flags. And this particular one has these two big sort of extended ovals of stars that intersect in the middle. And then it has a star between each arm. Uh, more than that, it has stripes that start on white and end on white. It's as rare as all the other features. I mean, you'll see that on illustrations of flags in the 18th century. Um, it's actually fairly common then, at least in illustrations, but on actual surviving flags, almost never encountered. So four flags total, including this one, in propeller medallions or four-pointed great stars, just a tiny handful that start on white and end on white, and maybe one of only four 
with different configurations on one side than the other, but then on top of that, it's just extraordinarily beautiful. And it's tiny. So in the 19th century, flags were generally eight feet long and larger. A garrison flag was 35 feet in length. So people, oh, they always find like a, a 10 footer or a 12 footer and say, I have a garrison flag. Uh, no, you don't. A garrison flag was like three or even four times what you're saying. But um, uh, this is, oh, maybe four and a half feet in length by uh, a little less than two and a half feet. The smaller you get, the more unusual it is. So even infantry battle flags were six by six and a half feet, about the size of a, of a, uh, a decent sized quilt in the 19th century. Enormous, taller than me, wider, yeah. wider than me, <laughs> thankfully. And once you get it in a the frame, then you'd be you know, seven by seven and a half feet. And if it has ties, it's even longer. The smallest flag that the Navy used uh, was typically six feet in length. And so even that was much bigger than this. And as you get smaller each foot, it gets more and more unusual. And to find a tiny flag at all, and then find one with some kind of extraordinary star pattern and all these other crazy features is just remarkable. So I want to bring you in for a closer look at this flag. One of the other nice things about this particular flag is that it's entirely hand-sewn. Now, a flag doesn't need to be entirely hand-sewn to be interesting by any means. And about 60 to 70% of Civil War flags have treadle-sewn stripes. This one is a homemade flag, and this person probably didn't have access to a sewing machine in this particular case, although sewing machines were becoming very plentiful in households at this time. And look, you can see the stars from that medallion pattern showing through here. Here's the center star, the ring around it, the other ring, and a star in each corner. So there's another. Wonderfully hand sewn. Look at how the stripes and the canton are seamed. This is really quite extraordinary. So on the other side, the seams are a lot neater. In fact, you don't get to see all this wonderful hand stitching. What's kind of remarkable about this is that the person who did it, while they didn't know how to do flat fell seams or just didn't have enough time to do them, they really got all the fabric to lay down nicely and being able to see this extraordinary stitch work is just, I think it's wonderful. As a as a uh, as someone who loves 19th century textiles, I love it. As someone who loves American folk art, it's just terrific to see this. And so there was no question what side of the flag I wanted to show. So another unusual feature, as if there aren't enough already, is that the canton or the blue area rests on a ninth stripe instead of the eighth stripe. There was no prescribed method, but that's just not how it was typically done. This is an all cotton flag, and cotton was a poor fabric of choice for flag making because cotton absorbs water and wool bunting, the primary fabric used in commercial flags, uh, well, that shed water while cotton absorbs water that meant that cotton got heavy and it would rot and it was just a poor fabric selection however wool bunting was not used for clothing manufacturing or anything of the sort it was only used for flags and banners and it wasn't widely available so unless you could access a ship's chandler or something of that nature or you could buy some from a professional flag maker, there just wasn't any way to acquire it easily 
and that made cotton the fabric of choice for homemade flags as a default. So it's certainly not unexpected here. It was inexpensive and it was available. And to a person that didn't make flags for a living, it seemed like the right thing to use. So one thing that you can't see here is the reverse of the flag. So I would like to show you an image of it. Have a look. So a le very legitimate question is, why is there a different star pattern on one side than the other? Why would somebody even do such a thing? Well, they didn't very often, but what people did with flags, just like with quilts, is that multiple people worked on the same textile. I think this flag was probably made in uh, a household among different family members. Maybe two sisters, maybe a mother and a daughter. It was very common with quilting for multiple individuals in a community and a family unit to work on one quilt. And I think that this was probably done by at least one little girl. So this Lemoyne star that you see on this side, a six pointed or an eight pointed star, uh, is common to the quilting world. And I think was probably easier to clip to. Well, you may have heard of the story about Betsy Ross and, you know, being able to create a five-pointed star with one snip of the scissors. I don't know how to do that personally. I think they teach you that at the Betsy Ross house. Uh, I missed that tutorial, I think. But this would be much easier to do in that fashion. And it does look like they were consistently done by probably by folding them. And it may be that, say, it could be done by two sisters who had different ideas about how they wanted their flag to look. At this time, you know, we're early in the war. It's very, very possible that this was gifted to a soldier when he went away to war or presented to a unit when it mustered in. Imagine if your husband or your son or your older brother was going away uh, for a term with the army, how you would turn out to support him when that group of soldiers mustered in and left. You might make him some kind of memento to take with him. You might make some kind of memento to give to the unit. This was probably carried and displayed in some capacity. Along the hoist here, it was tacked to a stick either to be waved in celebration or to be carried. And that was a very typical way to affix even a silk battle flag to its staff. They were often tacked along the hoist. So probably we have two different family members here, probably a little girl making this who saw her mother or her aunt or her grandmother or someone maybe even participated in making quilts. Now, these are the edges of these stars on both sides are not turned under. That's kind of suggested that this is children too because applique work was tough and you had to turn the edges of the piece of fabric under and stitch them into place. And it's, it's a difficult task even for a quilter. One of the girls that works for me as a conservator um, uh, is, a, is an excellent sewer, and she's been a quilter pretty much all her life, but she doesn't do applique work, and she talks about it as being especially difficult. And ask any quilter, you'll find that that's the case. Some people can do applique work, some can't. Um, now, it would also might explain why they stitched down the stripes in this fashion. Uh, now, it could be that they just didn't have enough fabric, and there wasn't enough um, uh, there wasn't enough of it to be able to turn over one more time to make uh, a flat fell seam. But, well, with the stitching being this way on the stars, maybe it was just done in haste. 
that's a possibility. But it does sort of suggest that this is a um, someone who didn't sew as much and probably didn't quilt as much and hadn't developed that skill for applique work. So let's take a close look at the star pattern front and back. Have a peek. So, terrific Civil War flag with one of the most rare star designs that you'll ever encounter. Eight pointed stars, stripes that start on white, end on white, and in a tiny scale, and with a canton in an odd position, and wonderful stitchery, and great colors, and a tiny size for the period. Just an extraordinary thing. So thanks for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed this wonderful Civil War homemade flag, opening two years of the war, Kansas statehood. Uh, beautiful, beautiful thing that I'm just uh, so honored to be able to own and to share with you. So see you again next time.